What's up everyone, Talent from the Airsoft headquarters here. Welcome back and today I have a product that we just got in yesterday. So these are brand new to the market and brand new to the store. So this is the Elite Force Legend Series Saddle Rifle CO2 Powered Lever Action Airsoft Rifle. That's a very long title but I have to make sure I say everything. Now. What is awesome about this is the fact that just about every one of us, as we were growing up, always seemed to have some sort of fantasy as far as being a rancher or maybe a cowboy of some sort. And while the real lever actions tend to be a little bit more expensive, the airsoft one that we can actually use and engage with and play with our friends with makes it that much awesomer. Now, there are several other brands that already make lever action rifles, however, very, very, very few of them actually produce shell ejecting lever actions. Huh? I said that, shell ejecting. These take the Legend series standard uh, little stainless steel shells that you can use on the single action revolvers that we've had out for about two years now, and these can go inside of the magazine tube here. Now the barrel, the magazine tube as well as the receiver is full metal construction. Same with the handle down here. The imitation wood and the stock are going to be a polymer construction, making it nice and lightweight. So while it would be very, very cool to have real wood, I know it would have been more expensive and heavier, especially with the stock here, having that proprietary or that unique dual 12 gram CO2 canister, yep, I said that correctly, the dual 12 gram CO2 canister. Now that, that's something in and of itself. I gotta go over the complete rifle. There's a lot of new and awesome features with the rifle. So we're gonna start, like always, starting towards the tip. The mandatory orange flash hider. The metal barrel, which is a culmination of I think 26 inches. Overall, the rifle length is 38 and a quarter inches. And that, it takes up a lot of the frame. I've got to go way back here if I want to get the entire rifle in stock. This is a long boy, don't get me wrong. So overall, a long length barrel combined with a long length of magazine tube. Now the magazine tube is going to be actually functional. It holds 10 total shells with the one in the chamber, so you get 11 total shots. Going back, we have the imitation, oh shoot, I totally forgot we have the front iron sight post and that it's just that it's a post towards the back here is going to be a piece of bronze and i think if i'm correct that is to make the uh, front tab stand out from the rear iron sight which is just a adjustable leaf so there's not a whole lot of distinguishing the front post to the rear leaf especially looking at a darker target <clears throat> so i think they put the bronze right there just to make it pop and stand out a little bit more maybe making a little bit more accurate but this is not adjustable so it's just a post towards the rear is going to be a leaf sight that is adjustable as far as elevation and that's it you cannot change windage so if the bbs are curving off a little bit that's due to wind so you just got to compensate the rifle by holding it left or holding it right according to that wind Towards the back here is going to be on the left side of the receiver, a little lanyard loop. Now, a lot of people don't realize that lanyard loop actually has function aside from hanging your Rainbow Six Siege collectibles or charms. This is actually what ranchers or cowboys would hang their rifle by. So while they're in the saddle, riding their horse, this is going to sit at the ready with that looped into place. And so when they need it, it's a quick untie or a quick pull up, and then they're ready to go and start shooting either animals or maybe bad people within the real world. With Airsoft, doesn't really have any sort of functionality because the majority of Airsoft players won't be riding horseback while going into Airsoft battle. Again, most of us. Towards the right side of the receiver is going to be that little window that has a heavy spring behind it in order to load each single shell. So there's one shell, two shell, three shell, and 
four shell. Now I did say that's a heavy spring, so you will have to get used to it, but with that lever going all the way down, so it loads the shell up into the chamber, and if you rock that arm back, it loads the shell, which you can fire, but I'm not going to because I charged the rifle with CO2 already. So if you go back, out pops the shell. And then it also preloads another one so you can come back, fire that one that's in the chamber, rack that forward, catch the shell, boom. And last one, because I did a total of four, just like that. Now, this already raises a couple issues with the fact that you need to purchase individual shells. Well, fear not, inside the package there is 20 total shells, so you have enough for one total tube and another. So, you're going to be good to go for at least 20 total shots. Now, if you need to purchase more, there are plenty of aftermarket shells, or at least from Elite Force Legend Series shells, available on the market if you need to purchase more. Another issue is the fact that once you eject those shells, especially on the airsoft field, there is a possibility that you might lose them. So getting good as far as knowing where those shells are going to land and catching them, or at least knowing where the shells are landing, that is going to be to your advantage. As of right now, I don't think there's any sort of way to realistically play competitively with a bunch of other people on the field and keep track of all the shells that you might be dropping, other than maybe taking up a uh, shooting position, maybe in a brush, in the brush or something, laying down in a prone position, and then while the rifle is close to the ground, you can at least shoot from a secluded position and collect the shells on the ground if you do get shot or if you need to move. That I think is the most realistic method for using this and keeping track of your shells in a thorough manner. But just a heads up, you could lose shells. Going farther back, just ever so slightly, we do have the hammer assembly. Now the hammer is a pretty unique feature, uh, especially if we wanna talk about the safety selector here, that while the hammer is back, that safety cannot be engaged. What you need to do is you need to push downward on the hammer with your thumb, with your uh, index finger, press down on the trigger until it's completely pressed and slowly release that hammer into a forward position and then you can release the trigger. While the hammer is forward, you can engage that safety. Even if there is a shell inside the chamber, you can still release that hammer and engage that safety. If there is a shell in there and you do intend to fire it, you take that safety off, rock that hammer back and you can fire it. However, like I said, I have this gassed, don't wanna fire it. With the lever action, this is a very, very large handle. It's really big, and I probably can already predict what you're thinking. No, you should not. And for those of you who do not probably pick up what I'm putting down, because it's so large, if no one has seen Arnold Schwarzenegger in Terminator with that lever action shotgun, what he does is with one hand rocks that forward, putting a shell inside the chamber, and with that one hand, he is rotating the entire shotgun. Now I'm trying to carefully hold this. It points back at him, rocks it back forward, and he grasps it in his one hand, all while doing this on a motorcycle. He's able to rock this back and forth, which I don't want to do because I don't want to possibly be the one to tell you, you can't do that and break a brand new product. Definitely don't want to do that. So I'm going to tell you right now, do not do that. Do not, do not, do not. Don't try it, don't think about it, don't tell anyone to think about it. We never talked about this, got it? Underneath of that lever is going to be a small little pin. Now there is going to be a small little spring behind there. And what you have to do is you have to have your lever all the way against that pin and completely engaged for you to fire. However, again, I don't want to dry fire this. If you have that pin only partially engaged, it will not fire. If you have that lever slightly forward, it will not fire. So if you are having any sort of trouble, make sure your safety is off and make sure that that lever is all the way engaged with that pin, just a heads up. So you have to have full contact, a full grip in order to fire. 
Now, towards the back of the stock here, I can take the butt stock off, but I won't be able to show you how to load that CO2, unfortunately. So, on the back there is going to be a little circle that has lock, unlock, and a little arrow that tells you to open or close. Now, this is pretty easy. So what I do is I take my thumb, I press in, and I rotate it counterclockwise to where the arrow with the uh, the arrow with the word open sign is pointing upward and then I can take the entire back plate of that stock and I can pull it off just like that. Now, you may notice that there is a cool little key feature that has a little octagonal or a hectagonal piece on there. Make sure you don't lose that. And then on the bottom here is going to be a little plate that coincidentally has the exact same size Allen as on the back of the plate. Ooh, ooh. So you can take your back plate, you can slide it inside of there, and you can rotate that plunger out of place so you can load your CO2 inside of there. Now, this is a dual CO2 canister air chamber, which means CO2 is going to be facing one way, the other CO2 is facing this way. And while they're in the air chamber, they're both going to be punctured and they're both going to be releasing gas. It is very critical if you want to get all of your shots and be as efficient as possible to make sure both canisters are punctured. It is critical that you make sure that happens. So the neck needs to be pointed outward, neck needs to be pointed outward, and they need to sit butt to butt inside of the air chamber itself. That would sit right about here, right about there. And then you would Rotate that plunger inward with the back plate until you hear the CO2 hiss from being punctured, at which point you're going to continue to rotate that plate until the hissing stops. Do not go any further. You could potentially over tighten that CO2, break some of those puncture pins, and you would break your brand new rifle. And we're not in the market to break brand new rifles, let's be completely honest. So then you're going to, once you have that plunger installed, slap that butt plate all the way to the back, with your thumb or any other type of tool, push inward and rotate clockwise until the arrow with the word lock is pointed upward, at which point your butt plate is locked into place and cannot go anywhere. At that point, your CO2 is charged and ready to go. Now, I'm going to be taking 0 .20, um, 0.20 grams of BB and putting them through a chronograph so we can see exactly what the velocity is. I have a total of 10 shots, 10 total shells. And then I'm trying to multitask, which is not going very well. And then we're going to see the fluctuation as far as max velocity, as well as what it could drop down to in 10 total shots. After that point, we're gonna be doing a classic Airsoft Headquarters range test at 25 feet, 50 feet, and 100 feet. Uh, it is getting late in the season, so hopefully the sunset hasn't dropped too low. It is, what time is it here? It is seven o'clock. I hope I am not too late. So we're gonna hurry over to the chronograph station and we're going to get a chronographic reading. And then we're going to do a range test with probably 0.28s. And we're gonna see what it does. So, let's go over to the corner station real quick. So, rack one in. Four sixty. Did not go forward all the way. There we go. Just didn't load it correctly. Mr. Shell. Well, come on. I only load nine. Do I have one more in my pocket? Results of nine total shots. Cause I don't know where number 10 went. 
I put them all in my pocket. I could have sworn I put all 10 shots into my pocket. I may have just been really stupid. Anyway, out of nine total shots, we have a maximum of 460 feet per second, a minimum of 416 feet per second. So in the matter of nine shots, we had a drop of 40, no, 32 feet per second. Future me, do some math with an average of 435 feet per second. So not too bad. Overall, you will need to be very, very careful as far as with your local outdoor field specifically to make sure that this can get chronographed as a designated marksman rifle if your outdoor field does do that sort of classification. Otherwise, maybe ballot hack special event. I would definitely like to see this legend series make it to one of those events. And maybe we go play one. We'll see. Anyway, over to the range. All right, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, Junit Classic Airsoft Headquarters fashion with a one loaded in. By the way, these are .30s, just so I made that distinction. And the leaf sight is in the lowest position, I think. Well, actually, we'll uh, go to the first notch. And then uh, 25 feet. So we'll see how it goes. I think there's, that's 25 feet there. Aiming for the head. And that was five right there. So then we're gonna knock this out to 50 feet. Okay, 50 feet and aiming for the chest. Oh, can't lose that. Five total shots, kicking it out to 100 feet. Now this one is gonna be a doozy. Uh, all right, 100 feet, aiming for the body. We'll see how it goes. last shot I heard was a miss. Uh, the last shot I heard was a miss. All right, let's go get the target. We'll see how it did. At 25 feet, we did see some overhopping with .30s, and that was aiming for the head of our two and a half foot tall target, about a human sized torso compared to me. Overall, the profile is slightly smaller since, you know, it's, it's a paper target. Anyway, out of five total shots, 25 feet, two of them missed the paper completely, but three did impact the head as intended. Kicked it out to 50 feet, and we had five total shots on the body. Not too bad at 50 feet. At 100 feet, that's where we started to see the struggle of the iron sights. I did have some sort of issue as far as, again, having the black on black. Now the bronze did help as far as knowing where about my uh, point of aim is, but as far as actually lining up the rest of that post in conjunction with that rear iron sight, a little bit tougher. So suggestion for anyone that wants to pick this up for actual gameplay use is either completely paint that front post bronze or paint just that little rear leaf face 
bronze coloration or a slightly brown coloration, something to distinguish between the bronze, this color, and then the black post, just so that you're able to get those more accurate shots at 100 feet, uh, which only three out of five shots did impact the target. Now, most outdoor fields are going to have a regulation of designated marksman rifles shooting over that 400 feet per second mark or velocity to have a 100 uh, foot minimum engagement distance, meaning anyone outside of that 100 feet, you're good and clear to engage. Now, the issue is that if these are the results at 25, 50, and 100, and 100 not being so hot on a fully profiled person, if someone's got an elbow or a boot hanging out of a corner or you're only seeing part of a person, those 100 foot plus shots might be a little bit harder to try to hit. So anyone that wants to pick this up should be aware as far as the limitations of this rifle and the distance as well as getting a good handling for the either point of impact or where those BBs are going to fly and what specific weights. Now the .30s, I went a little bit higher to try to compensate for the fact that the saddle gun does not have an adjustable hop up. It has a fixed hop up as far as the amount of backspin that BB is going to have, but at 25 feet, we did see some overhop. Out at 50 and 100, it seemed to level off from what I could see. Now I did have my glasses on to try to see further away since I'm one of those nerds and I need glasses. And unfortunately I forgot to put contacts in since I prefer glasses. But uh, yeah, I think with the limitations of the shooter and limitations of the rifle and limitations of the rounds themselves being a uh, plastic ball bearing that's going through a smooth bore inner barrel, these are the results. So anyone that wants to try to get a little bit better of consistency, maybe going with a heavier weight, maybe having some more time behind the rifle and knowing where those impacts are going to be, as well as maybe modifying to where you can fit a scope or something onto here, or making those minor adjustments to the rear sight or the front sight. Just my two cents. You guys can tell me what you think down below in the comments section. Now, as far as overall results of the saddle gun, I think it's a really solid build. I like the fact that it actually has a realistic loading feature and a realistic shell ejecting feature. That was a money shot if I ever saw one. Now, the issue comes down to where do you get more shells? How are you supposed to pick them up off the field after they've been ejected? And like I was saying before, as far as sitting down in a prone position, and I'm using the table as an example, being down in a prone position, using some sort of assistance as far as positioning that barrel so you can be very close to the ground. So when you can move that lever down, eject the shells, they don't go too far. Versus what I was showing in that range test as far as standing completely up, throwing that lever, and then having the shells fall where they fall. And they fell everywhere, unfortunately. Another thing is the fact that you guys saw it in the uh, range test as well, was if I was trying to rack these a little too fast, that the lever itself would get caught up. And so it's a very critical thing that you do not try to force that lever forward. Instead, try to reposition that lever as far as where to grab the shell itself. You know, rack this back and forth a couple times. Maybe even you have to go halfway and then eject that shell completely just so you don't get the possibility of messing anything up. Now, this is a brand new rifle, so it could be the fact that it still needs to get worn in. But as far as the action of loading the shells, that I have noticed has become significantly easier. In fact, it has become much easier to open that window with my thumb and load each individual shell in. Awesome. That did not take much wear in at all. As far as getting that lever going, and you'll notice that I need to do a C clamp over the barrel to continue to push backwards and control the rifle overall. Pop. That time I did not have any sort of issues. 
awesome. But you did see me a couple of times get hung up. Now I've got shells everywhere. Another thing is you need to have the lever down if you want to load any more of those shells. So one, two, three, since they're on the table right in front of me. Now with a modified C-clamp or a C-clamp, I'm not able to aim down sights, so I have to move my thumb out of the way. Take a shot, put my thumb back over, move my thumb, shot, another shot. Ooh, that one got hung up. And just like that. Final note is that every time you reload the CO2, you will need to purchase what is called the RWS air chamber lube to each end of the CO2 capsule in order to best regulate or at least um, get lube inside of the internals of the rifle itself for maintenance and cleanliness. Because it is a proprietary based system, there is no way to disassemble this for any sort of internal cleaning, stuff like that, that I'm aware of. And I'm not gonna be the one to venture into trying to get this cleaned out or anything like that. So I'm going to let someone else that is more adventurous try to take this apart and possibly even do a video on how to disassemble it and how to clean it properly. I just read the manual on far as, as far as how to best prepare the CO2 and how to make sure that the rifle lasts as long as possible. Make sure you read the manual. I did the job for you, but that doesn't mean that you should not read it either. Got me? Good. Anyway, overall, I think it's a solid platform. I would give this a nine out of 10. If I had to do some sort of actual um, rating system, overall, I think it's a hassle that shells can't get lost, but I think that the actual coolness factor of the lever action, the shell ejecting, the realistic feel, despite the polymer handguard and stock, because I know the limitations, I understand that, but man, is this a cool freaking rifle. So that's why I would personally give this a nine out of 10. What would you rate this on a 10 star scale? Would you put this closer to the 10 mark or closer to the one? And let me know your reasons why. And that's going to be it for this video. If you guys have any further questions, put them down in the comments section below. Of course, like and subscribe if you like this type of content. Uh, let me know if you think I need to improve on anything, stuff like that. You guys stay safe, stay clean, stay positive, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care. Nah, cowboy! Yeah!